lady right here is my fiance Kim. She's going to be helping me with the slideshow. She's also in charge of crowd control. So a couple of you big dudes I've seen back here, chill out. You have to answer to her. Anyways, what we want to do is start off with, we're going to talk about a little bit about myself and my background and how I came to be where I'm actually here today to help you folks. We're going to talk a little bit about how, when, where to find shed antlers. Then we're going to talk about how to get your dog to go out and do all the work for you so you can be like me and just ride around on your gator and let the dog do everything. It's all good? And hey, and this is a pretty smart looking group too, by the way. So we're going to give you guys some questions and answers for you to try to come up with the right answer. I'll give you the question and you can win some free stuff. Sound good? Yeah. All right. Everybody likes to win stuff, right? That's what I'm talking about. So today we're not only going to learn something, we're going to have fun doing it, which is a key to training a dog. If a dog has fun learning, he's going to want to learn. If a dog's struggling with it and it's not a pleasurable thing, you're really going to have a handful there. I'm to introduce you to my little girlfriend Haley right here. She's 10 weeks old, yellow lamb, future shed handler dog of America. <laughs> but uh, we've already got her started a little bit on the handler. We got her started a little bit on, on uh, learning how to earn praise, which is a key to our program. Our program is a praise-oriented, reward-driven program. And we're going to teach you how to properly praise a dog. We're going to teach you how to properly reward a dog and when to properly do it. Um, just to show you a little bit about myself, if you look at this slide right here, we've got dogs, as I've been, a, I've been breeding dogs professionally for 20 years. Okay. During that time, I've met several people from different facets of the industry that were seeking out my sporting breed. People from diabetic detection. They want that dog with that good nose that's trainable. People from search and rescue. They want that dog that's easily trainable that wants to please them. We've got, dog, we've got dogs, believe it or not, doing bed bug detection. Anybody familiar with that? We have dogs that are trained to go into hospitals, dormitories, theaters, and search for bed bugs so the exterminators know where to treat the area. Saves them a lot of money. Pretty cool. You get a dog to find a bed bug, I think I can get a dog to find an antler. Now, we also have dogs that are today working for the United States Marine Corps overseas in Afghanistan. They are anti-terrorist dogs that are saving American soldiers' lives. And it's something I'm very proud to be a part of. So, all right. These dogs are over there living in the barracks with the guys, searching through cars, searching through buildings, looking for, looking for bombs, and, and helping our soldiers stay alive and keeping them happy while they're doing it. They actually, something that's very touching to me and something that means a lot to me, on November 15th, of 2009, which is the opening day of firearm season in Michigan, a Michigan soldier over there had one of my puppies that he was assigned to flew a flag in honor of me in Afghanistan. Now, how cool is that? That is today in my den, proudly displayed with all my other little trophies of that mean nothing to anybody else, but they mean something to me. So, as, as we go through this, if you have any questions, let me know. Now, how many people have been to the Deer Turkey before? Probably about 30%. Now, how many have been to a deer and turkey seminar before? 80%. More people have been to a seminar than they have to the show. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I like that. Uh, that's my granddaughter, Leah. She's a future dog trainer, by the way. She told me the other day she's going to be a dog trainer, just like Bumpa. Um, how many people here shed hunt actively? Oh, we got about half. That's pretty good. Now let me ask you, how many people have ever had the privilege of shed hunting with a dog? I have two. It's a relatively new concept, right? That's why this place has been filling up. We've done seminars all over the Midwest this year. Everybody wants to know how to train or shed antler dog. It's cool. That's a little black lab out of our kennel named Dixie. I'll tell you a quick story about her. We went to Springfield, Illinois a year ago. 
And we went through 10 hours of the worst blizzard you've ever driven in your life, pulling a dog trailer full of puppies. I stepped out of the truck at the hotel, frazzled on my last nerve, and lo and behold, this couple walks up to me and they said, is that dog for sale? Well, we ended up doing a, park, a deal in the parking lot, five below zero. That dog actually came back to me, here, that dog actually came back to me for training, spent three months with me, and today is hunting shed antlers. He called me this morning, he actually texted me this morning, he said they got two today. She got one, he got one, and they're still out. How cool is that, right? Why do we need a shed handler dog? Heck, I can walk out and find them myself. Why would I need a dog? There's lots of reasons why, and I'll go through them with you. One, you're gonna find more sheds. I'm gonna give you a perfect example. I was working a little yellow lab named Blondie, and Blondie walked up to this brush pile, and she starts bouncing around, and I thought, well, are you on a rabbit, or, you know, I actually scolded her, said, get out of there, come on, let's go. She dives into that brush pile, starts rooting around and pulls out one of the largest shed antlers ever to be found in Michigan. <laughs> Actually, what she found was this little bitty antler that some animal, a possum, a coon, a squirrel, a mouse, had found and had gone underneath that brush pile and made a meal out of the forage on this and the, and the mineral ingredients in it. I would have never even looked in that brush pile much less found one in there. So, that, that tells you right there, you ask, yes, you are gonna find more sheds. Extend your hunting season. All of us go out, August, September, we shoot our bow, we build our stands, we do our stuff, we cut our lanes, and then in December, we're done. I don't get serious till December. That's when my hunting season starts. I hunt, oh, trust me, I sit in my deer shack and I hunt. I get my tree stand, I bow hunt, but when I get serious is when the shed season rolls around. So when most people are hunting from September to December, I'm hunting from September to April. And as you can see, how good a shape it keeps me in, being out there walking. Who's laughing? Okay. Access to property. Something I didn't plan on. I don't know how it is here in Ohio. But in Michigan, we all have very small parcels and there's a lot of hunting pressure and a lot of competition. And when I set foot on a neighbor's property, guess what I am? I'm a no good SOB, okay? When people found out I had shed dogs, I'm everybody's best friend. Everybody wants to hang around with Lucky from January to April. He's a great guy, come on over Lucky, come hunt my property. Let's go find some shed antlers. I have been able to access property I never dreamed of setting foot on. Family activity. That's my very good friend Carrie. I met her here at Ohio Deer Turkey Spectacular four years ago. That's her nephew. And that is obviously an EHD deer right there. One had passed away. We all went through that together, didn't we? But another advantage of having a shed antler dog is you're going to cover more area. Now, we'll watch this quick clip. Wait a minute, let me back up just a second, okay? When you guys came in, I said this looked like a really smart group, didn't I? If I remember, I said this looks like one of my more intelligent classes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna watch this video, and I want you to pay really close attention to how much ground this dog covers. And then we're gonna ask you some questions about that, and somebody's gonna get to win something cool, okay? He's gonna hit the scent of the antler, retrieve the hand to earn the privilege of playing with a tennis ball. So I'm gonna tell Zero when it's ready to go, and my, my release word, heel, is okay. That was a perfect example of how hard that dog hit scent. Did you see his tempo change and his tail start going and his ears cup forward? He hit that scent of that antler. He knew right what he was on, right what he wanted, and how he was gonna earn a chance to play with his tennis ball. Now we've got a couple more planted out here. We're gonna work him for a few minutes. You'll see how nicely he cores. What we're to show you is that dog is actively searching for antlers. And as you'll notice, he was casting and quartering back and forth. And when he hit scent, he zoned in on it. His ears cut forward. The reason their ears cut forward, it holds in scent. Keeps that scent directed at their nose. His ears cut forward. 
His body language change, his activity level change, he's on something, boom, nails that antler, comes back to me. So knowing how much ground that dog can cover compared to me, we're gonna give the winner of this answer this beautiful white tail keychain, okay? What I want you folks to do, when I ask the question, is just blurt out the answer. And I'll do my very best to figure out who said the right thing, okay? Now, knowing how smart you are, you're probably all gonna get the same thing right, right away, but that's okay. But I only have one to go around, you gotta understand that. So now, when I walk one mile out shed hunting, who can tell me how many miles that dog just ran? Sir, congratulations. Give him a round of applause. Very good. When you walk one mile out hunting, that dog just ran seven miles. That's pretty impressive. You think you can find more antlers if you cover seven times as much more ground? Probably. Not only that, but you can smell it. We have to see it. I don't see that good anymore. But I know my dogs smell good. And what about the joy of sharing the field with a dog? Everybody loves their dog. We all got dogs, we all love them, we love being with them. What about sharing that dog, that time in the field with that dog? I'll tell you a little story. That particular dog right there, his name is Countryside Zero Tolerance. And I called him Zero. And the very first shed he ever found it was January 17th, I'm in a standing cornfield with a 50 mile an hour wind and it's five below zero. I've got the hat, the hood, the wind is blowing the corn. You know what it's like trying to hear in a cornfield. I'm walking on a deer run, it's, mind you, January in a standing cornfield. You know where every deer in the county is. I'm walking through that standing cornfield on a trail this wide, that deep in deer droppings. I'm like, man, I gotta find a shed antler in here. There's gotta be an antler in here. And I look, and there lays a half of a six-point rack. I'm like, great. Well, I don't want to pick it up. I want my dog to find it. So I holler, zero, zero, come on, boy, come on, boy, come on, boy. I turn around and look. I got my hood up, and it's noisy. I look. He's sitting right beside me with the other side in his mouth. Now, how cool is that? I felt like my kid just hit a grand slam in the World Series. I was so proud of that dog. I get goosebumps telling that story ten years later. <laughs> Okay, onward and upward. Shed antlers, you can have the best dog on the face of the earth. If you aren't hunting where the antlers are, you're not gonna find any. So, as a result, what I'd like to do is spend a little time teaching you the where, the when, and the hows to find antlers. Then we'll go into how to train your dog to do it for you, okay? Scouting is key. Folks, I do more scouting for shed antlers than I ever dreamed of doing for tree stand, tree stand placement. I can tell you right now, I live in northern Michigan. If you look at my hand, but everybody does this, right? Everybody from Michigan, this is our game. Look right in the tip of your thumbnail, and that's where I live, right on Lake Huron. When we left yesterday, we had about two and a half foot of snow on the level, and we got snow banks that are 15 foot deep. We'll be shed hunting by August, I'm sure of it. Anyways, I can tell you what has happened. When you got a dog, or when you got a deer, and it's October, and you got grass fields, fence rows, standing corn, standing soy, woodlot, that deer can be anywhere, right? When you got two foot of snow on the ground, where's that deer gonna be? He's either gonna be in his bedding area or his feeding area. We just cut down a million acres and we don't have to look for him. He's not there, he's, his antler's laying in that travel route back and forth. Food sources, typical year, I'll hunt a lot of food sources. In a typical year, I'll pull my gator, I, I ride a gator, I got a dog crate in the back, I'll pull up to a cornfield or I'll pull up to a soybean field or where we're at, there's a lot of sugar beets, and I'll glass that field. When I see something out of the ordinary, I let the dog out downwind and we go get it. We'll cover that whole 80 acre bean field in about an hour. 
Back that up a little bit, Kim. That particular rack right there, believe it or not, we planted rye right along my wood edge and found that laying right in the rye. Travel routes. What did we just talk about? Bedding area, feeding area, travel routes. This is a travel route. If you look, that's all open crops. Back down here is a deep, dark core bedding area. We've got where we went through our woods with brush hogs, main trails. What do those deer walk on? The trail. They want the easiest access. Where are they going to drop their antlers? In the trail. Deer yards. This year, all of our hunting will be done in the deer yards. We haven't seen a deer out in that open cornfield in months and months and months. All our deer were pushed down into that heavy cover. They're eating pine needles, cedar brow, and bark to stay alive. That's where I'm going to shed hunt. That's where they lost their antlers. That particular dog, if you'll notice, had uh, that particular dog, if you notice, this was a perennial deer bed. Are you guys familiar with perennial deer beds? Especially buck beds? That spot is totally inaccessible to anything but a whitetail. Every year a mature whitetail bedded in that spot. And when one of them got shot or pushed out, another one moved in right behind it. That's choice U.S. property, man. Location, location, location for you realtors out there. Everybody wanted that spot in the woods. They had to earn it because he was in a position where you could not approach him without him sneaking off. But guess what? His antlers laid there in April. I can go in there in April, it ain't no big deal. If I walk in there a week before bow season, I'll never see that deer again. Another advantage of shed hunting. Okay, so we learned how to find sheds where to find them, when to find them. Now the reason you're all here is to teach your dog how to do it for you, or how to do it with you, okay? We're gonna get into the meat and potatoes of where I start a puppy and where I finish a puppy, and when I'm done, I'm gonna have to ask you guys what I'm supposed to do, because you're gonna be so smart between winning all those prizes and all the things we're gonna do, we'll have a great time together. Starting off, you go and you see this puppy, she knows nothing more than her mother's milk. That's a five week old chocolate lab that doesn't have a clue. Now he's pretty good at untying my boot laces, but that's about the extent of it, okay? How am I gonna take that puppy right there and turn it into that dog you're looking at? 20 minutes from now, you're gonna know. We're gonna talk about reward. We're gonna talk about praise. And we're going to talk about tennis balls because I've watched police dogs find narcotics. I've watched search and rescue dogs pull kids out of fires. I've watched do dogs alarm people about bombs. And for what reason? Because they wanted to play with a tennis ball. And that's what we're going to teach you. Like we talked about earlier, I want a dog that really wants the ball, that really wants to go get them, and really wants to please me. Now, one of the things I will do is I will get down in an encouraging position to encourage the dog to come back to me with it. You know, some dogs want to grab a, grab the ball and run the other direction. Some dogs want to play the keep away game or do the victory lap. I want her to return directly to me. Uh, and this goes a long ways towards uh, finishing her, her training, if, is if I have a dog that wants to please me, and then when she does bring it back to me, you'll notice two things. One, when she recovers it, I don't praise her. What that does is that encourages dogs to go get it, and then once they find it, if we holler good boy, they think all they have to do is go find it, okay? We don't want that. We want to hold our praise until the task is complete, and by complete, they have to return it to me. So I'm going to get down into a position that's encouraging to her. I'm a six-foot tall man. I don't want to be intimidating. I want to be down at her level, have her come back to me. I'm not going to take the ball away from her. I'm going to praise her. The dog will run back to me for praise. It won't run back to me if I yank whatever she just got out of her mouth. So I'll demonstrate a little bit, and we want to basically make sure this puppy's going to be uh, meet the criteria for a shed dog. He wants to go get it and bring it back. So, Vegas. That a girl. That's a good girl. Good girl. Two things happened. Okay. 
She came back to me just as fast as she went after it. I really like that in a dog. The other thing that happened was she held on to it the whole time because I wasn't in a hurry to yank it away from her. She literally delivered a hand at 11 weeks old. Here, fetch it. See how I'm, I'm refraining from praise, but I'm encouraging. Good girl, good girl. And she even returned to the sit position and handed me the ball at 11 weeks old. That's amazing. That's something that you can work with. This is a very good friend of mine, Carrie, getting a high five from Cammy after Cammy found the first shed this year. Isn't that cool? That was her reward, was a high five. Rewards come in different, different ways. There's so many different ways to reward a dog. One, my voice can be a reward. My hand can be a re reward. The tennis ball can be a reward. You can, your imagination's the only thing that can stop it. Treats can be a reward. Everything you do can reward that dog. If used properly at the right time. And adjust your level of praise. There's something that nobody ever knows about. But I'm gonna tell you, dogs are super, super sensitive to praise. And what do I mean by that? When you start hunting with a shed antler dog, I guarantee you, as long as the day is long, as sure as I'm standing here, they're gonna bring you up a skull, or a carcass, or a rib cage. Bone is bone, baby. They're gonna bring you all that stuff back. But guess what? When that happens, you can't punish him because he's doing what you taught him. But what you do is you adjust your level of praise. Give him a little scratch on the head and say, okay, let's go. Brings back an antler, guess what? I'm slobbering all over that dog, rolling around on the ground, throwing a tennis ball. That dog's gonna go, man, I'm getting it. I'm starting to figure it out. Look at that good girl. Give her a hand, huh? That 10 week old dog retrieving that antler. Nice job. So what we got is the dogs learning how to earn. All my dogs have to earn praise. It's so easy to go, oh my gosh, Buster, you're so pretty. Good boy, pretty good boy. It's easy to do. But if you make them earn it, make them sit, make them lay down. I don't care what it is. Earn that praise. Pretty soon everything else will come into play. They'll start learning that, hey, I have to earn this. I want to please my master. Okay, introduction to the antler. All right, we started off with the tennis ball with the spike antler. Then when their teeth were sore, we went to the, by the way, that is one of the largest antlers I've ever found in Michigan. <laughs> Actually, it's not. But we did find both sides of that shed. I'll tell you a story about this. I walked into a bedding area, and there had to be 25 or 30 beds. There's still crusty snow, and it was melted where they laid. I said, man, there's got to be antlers in here. I stood still for about 10 minutes. I looked down, and there this lady right next to my foot. I'm like, wow, check it out. So I, you know when you're mushroom picking, you find a mushroom, you just stop and start looking? I stopped and started looking. And my dog worked, 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 worked. The other side of this was 10 feet away. I could have never saw it. So I got both sets of this. If I can find an antler like this, I can sure find one of you Ohio Bucks sheds, right? Okay, so we did the antler, we did the tennis ball, now the puppy's got her adult teeth in, and I go to this. And the reason I, I want something small that they can uh, handle, I want something they feel comfortable with, it's not a 97 inch antler that they can't pick up, and I cut all the points off it, you see that? I started doing that four or five years ago because if you've handled thousands of dogs, trust me folks, what can happen will. I was preventively trying to think of a dog maybe getting an antler in the eye or the mouth or something. Three weeks ago in Springfield, Illinois, a guy came up to my booth and said, Lucky, he says, my dog won't touch an antler. I said, why, what's wrong? Well, she got poked in the roof of the mouth with one, running across the backyard, and now she associates that with an unpleasant experience. Something to think about. Let's back up a little bit. We're gonna talk about that intro to the antler, and we've already got one big winner here, right? Who won that first prize? 
right here. Okay? Now, we're going to give you folks a chance to win one of these beautiful, beautiful, 100% cotton, washable, wearable, countryside, countryside kennel shed hunter t-shirts. Okay? Similar to what I got on, similar to what I got on, it will probably look a lot better on you. And the question I'm going to give you, and I want you all to blurt it out, first one to guess it gets it. How many different components are in an antler? Who said 12? Close. 13. 13. Yes, sir. Congratulations. Give him a hand. There are 13 different components in an antler. You have calcium. You have potash. You have zinc. You have copper. You even have lead in an antler. Why is that? How many people have read the articles where if you got good soil, you got big racks? Those racks absorb all those minerals and ingredients through that soil. Point I'm getting at. There's 13 items in that antler for that dog to smell. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Somehow them dogs are keying in on one of those components and picking them up. One or more. Another example I read in a training magazine. They told me that when you walk into a room and somebody's making beef stew, it smells good, doesn't it? It smells great. When a dog walks into a room and smells it, he smells peas, carrots, broth, meat. They have the ability to separate different scents. Something in that antler is attractive to those dogs and they will find it. Good job, congratulations. Hiding the antler. Folks, there's a 93 inch southeastern Ohio antler right there. You take 93 inches of antler, add 93 inches of antler, put a 20 inch spread on it, you're hunting a 200 class white tail buck. That's a very good friend of mine named Jason, who was at my seminar earlier this morning. And I asked Jason in front of the group, Jason, have you ever seen that buck? He said, no. We've hunted that property for seven years and have never seen that buck, never found the other side of the shed, nothing ever. That's shining at night, that's hunting hardcore. That buck lives there, but guess what? We couldn't see him, we couldn't kill him, so we found the sheds for shed antlers. I will take an area about this size, and I'll put a shed over there, I'll put a shed over there, a shed over there, a shed over there, okay? And what do I do? I'll say, let's just say like Haley right there, I'll say, Haley, over. Haley runs over, oh, an antler, picks it up, brings it to me. I play, 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 love, 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 cuddle, 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 tennis ball, tennis ball, tennis ball. Okay, Haley, over. Haley runs over, same thing happens. What did I just teach her? She says, man, when Lucky tells me to do something, I get, there's something good gonna happen. So now I've, A, taught the dog how to respond to human, B, taught the dog how to follow a hand signal, C, taught the dog over how to follow a verbal command, and D, taught the dog how to please me. Do what I say, you'll be rewarded and you will please me. Now how cool is that? How many people can teach a dog four things at one time? That's how we hide the antlers. And you want your dog to succeed, and you want him to enjoy it. The way I make them succeed is I don't hide two antlers and 120 acres of the thickest stuff God ever put on the face of the earth. I hide antlers in short, marginal cover. And I work them into the wind because I want them to succeed. I want them to do good. I'm teaching them how to make me happy. When I'm happy, I'm the master, the dog's happy. Kind of like at home. Mama happy, guy's happy, right? Happy wife, happy life. You guys know what I'm talking about. Um, these are two of my very good friends, Dave Haynes. Dave is official scorer for Ohio Bucks, Camaraderie Bucks, or Buckeye Buck Club. I don't know what they call it, but he's an official scorer. Those are two of his dogs. Their names are Boone and Crockett. That's cool, right? That's the first shed antler they ever found. Keep your session short and upbeat. 
Folks, if you don't remember nothing, remember this. I can get more done in six 10-minute sessions than I can in one hour session. Dogs have short attention spans. That puppy right there, she's good for about two tosses of that antler, and then it's play, cuddle, play, lick, chase. Keep your sessions short. The dog will learn more. If a good handler will know when his dog's had enough. I can read my dogs and say, okay, well, he's over there sniffing a cigarette bud or he just chased a leaf. This session's over, okay? And always, 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 always end on a positive note. And what I mean by that is if you're trying to teach a dog a new task and he's struggling, which is to be expected, don't finish on a struggle. Go back to something he's mastered, have him sit and love him for sitting. Have him stay, praise him for staying. That way he remembers. The last thing the dog does in a session is the first thing he remembers the next time you go out. So, long story short, do you want the dog to be miserable the next time you go to get him and take him training? Because he's thinking something's I'm going to be frustrated? Or do you want him to be happy because he remembers doing something good to please the master? And on a positive note. And change your training areas. That's a nice weekend of shed hunting, right? Change, change your training areas. Dogs can get very good. If I worked a dog in this room every day for a month, he'd be great in here. I guarantee you. What's going to happen when I take him out in the weeds? He isn't going to have a clue. Change your training areas. Cedar thickets, grass fields, corn stubble. Whatever you can think of, there might be an antler, it's a great place to train. And here's another thing too. That was Cammy's very first solo retrieve at eight months old. Training, people get hung up on training. They think, oh, that's, oh, that's, that's just training. Oh, I gotta train my dog, I gotta train my dog. That's tough. It's not, it's rehearsing. If you look at it like you're rehearsing, and I tell you, the Cleveland Indians are in Florida right now rehearsing for opening day, okay? What's more important is Justin Verlander's down there rehearsing for opening day. I'm a Michigan man. But that's all it is, it's rehearsing, okay? And I tell you something, I used to, I train dogs for a living. Buddy, that's a 365 day a year job. I ran into a funk four or five years ago because I had to go out and work them dogs. I had to go out and work those dogs. Well, then I decided that I'm going to go play with the dogs. I'm going out and I'm going to play with the dogs. Mentally that changed my whole outlook because now I'm out there playing with the dogs. And you know what happened that I didn't plan on? The dogs picked that up. They saw me walk in there, they saw my posture, they heard my voice, they saw my face, and they were excited to go to work, just like I was. When I was dreading it, they were dreading it. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. Can you teach an old dog new tricks? Kim might not think so. <laughs> no, but uh, yes, you can. I actually trained a six-year-old chocolate lab that I had shot probably no less than 200 ducks and, and hundreds and hundreds of pheasants over. But I love the way he quartered, I love the way he covered ground. I said, boy, he'll be a good shed antler dog. And I spent six weeks, and that dog was pounding antlers, but I was still catching, wanting to bird hunt. He's a little, once, once we kicked up a couple birds, he kind of like, oh, that bone can go. <laughs> yes, if Labradors are the best, Personally, I think so. If you look at the Labrador Retriever breed today, look at the different uses they have. Okay, I'm going to say the sporting dog is the best. And we can get into that a little bit more, but they are bred to search. They're bred to have noses. They're bred to cover ground. They're bred to retrieve. The four things I look for in a dog, and I don't care if it's a Shih Tzu. Search drive, retrieve drive, trainability, and desire to please me. If I can find a dog with those four items, I can get him to do anything. I could have him find a cocaine out here in a month. Uh, yes, miss, you have a question. Why was I wearing gloves? That's a great question. I got my nails done that day and I didn't want to ruin it. 
<laughs> no, actually, that's not true. <laughs> actually, what happened was uh, I wear rubber gloves because I try to save the integrity of that antler. And what I mean by that is these dogs are so darn smart. If I went to Big Boy that morning, drank coffee, had the, the hash browns and, and uh, bacon and eggs, guess what that antler's going to smell like? My breakfast or me. I don't want that dog out there searching for my smell. I want that dog searching for an antler. So I use rubber gloves when I handle all my antlers when I'm training. Great question. Did that help? Any other questions? That's good stuff. I love it. He asked me if I use any rack wax. I've never used it personally. I'm sure it works. But we just talked a few minutes ago about that handler having 13 different components in it. I, my dogs have consistently found antlers, even old antlers. I had a guy in here today told me he found one. His dogs found one in a dry creek bed that he figured had to be at least four years old because it was all bone dry chalk. Something in there. I didn't have no rack wax on it. Um, yes, sir. He asked me if they smell it more when I cut the antler off. I honestly don't know. I don't think so. They just, they love it. How young do I start them? That little puppy right there is 10 weeks old. She started. Eight weeks old. No problem with that. Start them right off the bat. I think with anything, the younger the better. That make that be her sole purpose in life. To find you an antler. Yes. She says back to the glove things. What about antlers that are all getting slobbery from the dogs and antlers I've already handled? I'll take a five gallon pail, put baking soda and warm water in it, wash them off, let them set in the sun, dry off, use them again. I can wash the smell myself and my dogs off those antlers. I can't wash the smell of that calcium, phosphorus, zinc, copper, lead. This is all good stuff, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, this young man says, how long does it take to usually train a dog? I like to say I can get them interested in a month and doing a somewhat adequate job in a month, but when I spend three months on a dog, that dog's going out and finding answers. One to three months would be my answer to that, depending on the dog and depending on the level you want it. They're pretty smart. You stay on them every day, they can do it. Okay, folks, here's a special treat for you. Yes, sir. I talked to you earlier and you trained all yourself. Uh, how long do you prefer to have one before you let them go home? He asked me, I'm a, I'm a trainer and I have a program where you can bring me your dog. How long do I prefer to have a dog before it goes home? I prefer to have that dog come in for three months. That gives him a three month program. That gives him time to adjust to me, my schedule. I'm his primary caregiver. I'm the one that's going to be taking care of you. This is what, how you're going to please me. Everything starts to click and it gives me time to do it right. I can push a dog through there in a month, but to really do it right, I like to have a dog for three months. Yes, sir. Trust me, in three months that dog's gonna know exactly what he's looking for. Yeah. And then what I do is I'll take, like the owner, like yourself, when you come up, you and I will go out on an actual seminar, an actual session. We'll do a training session together. I'll show you the commands I'm using, how I'm getting your dog to search, how I praise your dog, what your dog's doing, how to read your dog's body language, the whole nine yards. So you know, I've, I've been a firm believer and if I teach the handler, the dog is better. Okay, how many people have been on a shed hunt with a dog? I asked you that earlier. Was there two? Okay, well you're going on one right now. This was an actual shed hunt in northern Michigan that was filmed by Michigan Outdoors Television two years ago.
weeks back, I was able to tank along with my good friend Jim Miller from the Countryside Kennels in Bad Axe, Michigan. Jim was out doing a little training with one of his young labs. We were not working on basic obedience or water retrieves. This is one of Jim's antler dogs. Training antler dogs to find sheds is becoming a big deal. So as we hit the woods, Jim explained how this all works. Yeah, when I go, uh, my typical gear is, is a backpack to put them in. Uh, I, t I carry a compass, maybe a small folding saw in case we happen to find a uh, one that's passed away and also uh, some water for the dog but what I will do is occasionally with a young dog like this it's only eight months old I'll hide an antler here and there just to keep him excited about what we're doing keep him on track I don't want him to lose focus uh, you know he may start chasing oh he could chase birds or just lose his interest a little bit but if I keep that bone out there once in a while let him get an antler or two that keeps him on track and we seem to do much better this is not a polished adult. This was an actual training session with an eight-month-old pup. Now, Jim works these dogs almost every day, and from what he says, they're never too young to start working with antlers. Honestly, I think it's with anything, the younger the better. I want that antler to be king in that dog's life. I want that dog to know that to earn a reward, he has to be able to get, a, get me an antler. That has to be number one priority. We've got eight-week-old pups chasing them around the yard and, and carrying them around. Uh, this dog here, when he was four months old, I really started uh, investing some time into him. Uh, basically, we worked five days a week for two solid months. And at the end of that, I did have him retrieving to hand, um, actively searching. Now, he doesn't quarter quite as well as I'd like. He's not a real big running, searching type of dog. Um, but he's very thorough and, and he does a very adequate job for an eight month old pup. Hmm. I think as he gets older and his confidence builds and he learns the game, he's going to be outstanding. Okay, Jimmy, what we got is he found an antler and his reward was a tennis ball. Hmm. He will do anything to earn the privilege of playing with that tennis ball. Everything we do is, is praise oriented training. So it's a reward based program. So he found his prize and, and earned his reward. Hmm. Very simple. A positive reinforcement with a tennis ball is done by several narcotics dogs as well. Jim has started using this process more and more as the antler dog demand is growing. You know, we're seeing this all over. I was in Columbus, Ohio last weekend. Uh, we sold seven shed dogs down there. Um, there is a waiting list. Uh, we have four of those pups that aren't born yet. And I've got a program where you buy a pup off me, stays right with me for six months. You pick him up at six months of age, and you've got a dog working very similar to this one. Anything you do, whether it's your hobby or your relationship or your career, the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. That's a great, a great uh, word of advice. And, and I get so much out of these dogs because they give it right back. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful thing. Antler dogs are just another way to do what we all want to do, and that is extend our hunting seasons. For many, shed hunting is another way to be in the woods more often, and that is always a good thing. So whether you try it yourself or you have a guy like Jim help you out, a good shed dog may be something to consider this year in Michigan's Out of Doors. I noticed when you praise dogs drop the one knee, right? And when you're throwing the ball for him, how, how long do you do that before you carry on He says, how long do I throw the ball and play with him and stuff? Just a minute or two. I just want to get him so worked up and so happy and so rewarded. And then it's time to put the ball away, find the bone. I use the same thing every time. Find the bone. Find the bone. Yes, sir. Every dog varies. He says, what's the most time I go hunting? Every dog will vary. But I'm, here's something I do that will help extend your time with the dog in the field. Okay, I take frequent breaks, and I, I don't treat my dogs when I'm in the woods, and I'll tell you why. Because when that dog knows you've got treats in your pocket, what's he doing? Very good, he's jumping up and down on my pocket wanting a treat. I leave treats back in the truck, and I like the big milk bones, and the reason for that is they have calcium in them. Calcium restores muscle memory. We use it on our females when they start giving birth, the first thing I do is I give them 1,200 milligrams of calcium and it helps them retain that muscle memory after every puppy comes out. That dog's out there running and working. He's got two or three hours under his belt. Take a break, go back to the truck, 
feed him a milk bone, give him something to drink, 10 minutes off his feet resting, he's ready to go another hour or two. Good stuff. Any more questions? Well, these are questions people, yes, sir. Starting a puppy different than starting a six-year-old dog. Starting a puppy different than a six-year-old dog. I'm going to assume the six-year-old dog already knows how to take commands from humans. Now, I said that at the last session, and she said, no, he doesn't. But I, I can skip some of the stuff with an older dog that I have to do with a younger dog. What I'm trying to do, though, is the same principle. The antler is king. The antler is what you want. And the only time you're going to get to play with that tennis ball is if you find me that antler. Or your Kong ball. Or if your dog has a favorite toy or whatever it is he wants to play with, use that as his main source of reward for finding you that antler. You can accelerate with a silver dog. Good question. Well, this is what people ask me. Do they see it or do they smell it? Both. They see it and they smell it. Now you guys have done pretty good on your first two questions. Now, I'm going to give somebody a chance to win one of these world famous Training the Family Companion Gun Dog by James Lucky Miller. Okay? And this talks about how to have a well-mannered dog in the house, how to keep him jumping on grandma, all that good stuff that we don't know. We think we know. Now, what I'm going to do is, I said this was a very smart group, now didn't I? Remember that? We all got good memories, we're all smart. I said you guys were smart, and I'm going to make you prove it. I know we probably got a, quite a few physicists out here. I'm going to give you an equation, and you're going to come up with the answer. And the, the, out, and the question is, don't go blurt this out yet, because I want to give you some facts. The question is, how many times greater can a dog smell than a human? Now I'm going to give you some tips. I'm going to give you some, some things that lead you into the answer. The olfactory gland is a gland you use for your sense of smell. Okay, we all knew that. In a human, it can be three-eighths of an inch long. In some sporting breeds, it can be over three feet long. Pretty impressive, huh? Now get a load of this. On each centimeter of that olfactory gland, the human has 10 scent receptacles. 10. On each centimeter of that three foot long olfactory gland in that dog, he has 100 scent receptacles per centimeter. So each centimeter of his nose is 100 times stronger than mine. Well, 10 times, I'm sorry, because 110. So, with that knowledge that you've all absorbed, who can tell me how much stronger a dog's nose is than a human's? Okay, now folks, I've heard everything from 300 to 600,000. Okay, we're, we need to go lower. We need to go lower. 50, Who said 50? You're close. I'm going to give it to that young man right there because actually it's 58 times better than a, a human. Very good, sir. Would you hand him back there, please? Let's give him a big hand. He did a good job. So, folks. Let's think about this for a second. We've got a dog that covers seven miles to my mile. We've got a dog that smells 58 times better than me. How am I not going to find more sheds? It's simple math. How old is too old to train a dog? I think we talked about that. Can any dog find a shed? Yes, they can. I've trained, I've trained a number of different kinds of dogs. We've done boxers, we've done, oh shoot, German wire hair pointers, we've done labs, we've done English pointers, we've done cocker spaniels. But I will say that I don't think a chihuahua is going to go out there and cover as much ground as that mature lab right there. And I, I, highly, I highly doubt 
if a Shih Tzu that was bred to lay on a pillow is going to smell as good as one of these dogs. I like the sporting breeds. They've been bred for thousands of generations to seek, conquer, and retrieve. And oh, by the way, they like to please you too. That's half the training battle. When do I start obedience training? It's different with a shed dog than I do with a house dog. If I'm a house dog, I start immediately. Sit, stay, heal. With the shed antler dog, I don't want that dog to go out in the woods and heal. I want him to go out and search. So once I got that dog actively searching for antlers, then I start doing obedience. Might be six months old. They're gonna catch on even faster. Can a dog hunt both birds and antlers? Did we talk about that in this group? I think we did. You can, it's tough, but you can. Any questions other than those? Yes, sir. Do I let the dog chew on antlers? Yep. They, I, I let the dog have one toy. I'll show you what it is. When I see him chewing on the cord, Take it away from him giving this. When I see him chewing on his slippers, take it away from him giving this. When I see him chewing on his cell phone, take it away from giving this. Yes, sir. Right. Every day in the house, you just chew on Well, I do let him free choice. And then, then believe it or not, as cruel as I am, a couple of weeks before shed season, they don't get him. Okay, so you need to have it pretty much year round. But Take it away before you're Before shed season, I take it away because I want him to go out there and find one. Okay. Right or wrong, I don't know, but that's what I do. This is all cutting edge new stuff. Uh, no one heard of this five or ten years ago. We started doing it, and as I've done it, and I watched some of these films and stuff, I realized how much I've tweaked my own program to make myself even better than I was five years ago. Good questions. Anybody else? Okay, click to the next one. Oh, that's okay. Just a little, just a little work, folks. That's a that's a one-year collection. There's no reason you guys can't do that living down here in Buck Country. Access to property, good antler dog, knowledge of the white tail itself, all adds up to a pile of bone. Well, great. We're in booth 526. We've got antlers for sale. We've got part of that DVD you saw parts of for sale. We can answer questions one-on-one -on -one back there. Why don't you all give yourself a real big round of applause. You did a great job. You're a good audience. Very happy to have you. Uh, right down the middle aisle and to, the, to your right.